Welcome to another episode of the Collective Evolution podcast, first episode of 2023. Um, if you were to ask me what one of the biggest challenges that we face uh, is today when we're trying to make decisions about how to move forward as a society, it's absolutely the control of information and narratives that are going on uh, on our planet right now. It, 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 it is fueling the polarization, it is fueling division, and it is ultimately breaking down sense making. You know, I talk a lot about um, how as individuals, we need to work on ourselves to some extent and, and, and sort of improve our own ability to listen to each other, to communicate effectively, to examine and explore our own biases and, and our own worldviews. However, when you're in a landscape where information is being so tightly controlled, and there's so much algorithmic, uh, I, I guess you could say bias towards polarizing content or towards content uh, that, that fits a particular narrative, it makes this process very, very, very challenging. And so censorship is a huge issue. And uh, that's why we talked about it in one of the first of the seven episodes to sort of set up this uh, this entire podcast. And today my guest is going to be Jason Bassler. So we're going to, he's the founder of the Free Thought Project. And we're going to talk about this subject of censorship, this subject of narrative control. Uh, we're going to go through his story of how he got into journalism, of, of what happened to him when his entire Facebook page was eventually taken away, you know, about 3 million fans. We're going to get into the human element of this and, and kind of how it feels to go through this process of being an independent journalist and, and having everything taken away and then having to rebuild and having to find peace again and having to find ways to continue to do your work if that's what you feel inspired to do um, and sort of the, the trickiness that comes along with that. We'll also get into some, you know, very grounded material cases of um, court cases that tried to fight back against censorship, fight back against defamation, uh, involving various fact checkers, and we'll talk about what happened with those. We'll get into uh, the Twitter files and kind of how that's revealing what is going on, what we all suspected about government and big tech collaboration to to control narratives and to censor specific people. Um, because I think at the end of the day, and this I think will be the the light at the end of the tunnel to some extent in this uh, episode, um, we are seeing something change. We are seeing awareness being built at a very cultural level that is going to have a positive effect as we move forward in not only improving sense making, but bringing a greater understanding of cultural free speech back to general dialogue. Um, so that's a I think is kind of the light at the end of the tunnel here to some extent. But without further ado, let's jump into this episode with Jason Bassler. All right, Jason, welcome to the show. It's good to have you on. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me on. Happy to be here. That's, that's it. That's all. Um, I say we kind of go right back to the beginning a little bit here. And I'd love to hear before we get into censorship and, and some of the crazies of, of recent times in media, I'd love to hear kind of how you got started. Um, in media. How did it happen for you? Sure, man. Yeah. Well, it wasn't planned. It wasn't expected. I'd never thought I'd be on this life path, but uh, here I am fighting away vigorously. But uh, yeah, I think I've always had activism in my blood in one form or another. Uh, I grew up in the Bay Area. I was very much involved with uh, the punk rock skateboarding scene, which is kind of counterculture in itself. And uh and in the music, even the music within the punk rock scene, you know, this is I'm a bit older now. So this is in like the late 90s. Um, it very much spoke to a lot of the same concepts that we kind of pride ourselves on now, the same values that we have. So I feel like that was kind of the initial foundation. But as I got older, I was doing things in my area. I was doing uh, protests. It's, there wasn't a skate park in our area. There was very limited uh, places to skate and the places that we could skateboard. Uh, they wouldn't let us skate because they were public and the cops would come or right. uh, whatever. So that was kind of the beginning foundation. And early into my 20s or so, that was right around the time the 9-11 happened, the Iraq war. So I was always out there in the streets protesting, doing the anti-war protests. Um, sometimes it was random. Sometimes I was going with groups. But I feel like I always had it in my blood. But somewhere around the Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, which was 2011, I realized that I didn't really have a firm grasp on my own ideology. And I realized that, hey, like I have a computer in my pocket uh, in the age of information, ignorance is a choice. And I have no excuses why I can't ac actually educate myself, uh, come to an understanding of where I am, who I am, what I believe in, what my values and principles are. So around that time, I just started researching like crazy, you know, as a sponge, I was just absorbing as much information as I could. 
And uh, mind you, Joe, this was during during the the internet golden age, right? Like this is right. when there was no censorship. Uh, all this information was readily available, um, and there was loads of it. There was tons of it, much more than there is today. So it kind of light, lit a spark under me. And around that same time, uh, I started seeing Ron Paul's name around everywhere because mm -hmm. he was uh, the 2012 presidential um, candidate for the Republican Party. So I was like, who is this Ron Paul guy? Kind of had to start to in investigate and research what he was all about. And then next thing I know, it was almost like a, a truck hit me. I was like, wow, like this guy is speaking everything that makes sense to me. I've never heard a politician sound like this before. Who is this guy? So uh, it didn't take long. I was on the, the Ron Paul uh, train. I was out there um, doing what I could to uh, get his name out there. I was doing banner hangs. I was doing tabling. I was involved with the Ron Paul campaign of 2012. So uh, I was doing basically everything I could. And at that time, I kind of had this epiphany like, hey, I'm out here on the streets. You know, I'm, I'm doing some of these anti-war protests. I'm doing the banner hangs. Like I could probably reach a lot more people if I was online putting out this type of information and trying mm -hmm. to reach people, connect with people, you know, it, there's a, there's a lot of people you could reach stand on the sign of the side of the street with a sign, but like the internet would seem like this promising place where there wasn't a whole lot of traction at that point. Uh, around that time, the Facebook pages just started to kind of take off. So yep. I started a Facebook page or two. I actually had a couple of Tumblr accounts. If you could believe that still have them, they've been taken down twice, got them back. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, it's been a long haul, but um, somewhere around that time, let's see, about a, a year later, this is talk, talking about like 2013 now, uh, we started the Free Thought Project, myself mm -hmm. and Matt Agarist. And um, so, yeah, the rest is history. And uh, <laughs> I know you know we've had a, a quite a turbulent ride since then. Uh, at one point, you know, we were within the top 500 websites in the country, which uh, is huge. You know, I don't even know how we did that, but there was just a huge demand for the information we were putting out in 2013. Uh, between those years of 2013 and 2017, we were growing like crazy. We were reaching tons and tons of people. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's similar to you guys, but we were reaching upwards of like 20 to 30, sometimes 40, 50 million people a week, uh, something around like 20 to 30 to 40,000 new fans and followers a week. It mm -hmm. almost sounds crazy now because these numbers are like astronomical, you know, <laughs> yeah. and they're just not even allowed to happen anymore. But I have the screenshots, like I have the receipts, mm -hmm. so I'm not just mm -hmm. talking out of my behind here. Yeah. But so anyway, uh, yeah, that was uh, probably around the peak, around 2017, 2018, October, uh, that dreadful month. We ended up uh, being banned from both Facebook and Twitter on the same day, um, resulting in a loss of nearly 6 million fans. And uh, we've just been basically picking up the pieces since, you know, that was four years ago now. Um, on that day, we had to uh, basically fire all of our writers, our entire team, yeah. our social media team. We had no more reach. We had no more, more way to have the ad revenue coming in. We had no more way to pay them. So um, it was quite the life trajectory changer and uh, quite humbling, I guess you could say. Yeah. I mean, you have, uh, you have a lot of sort of, I would say some similarity crossovers in terms of how uh, not only I grew up with the skateboarding uh, and the punk rock scene to some extent, but, <laughs> but also um, not 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 planning to get into to media and just kind of happened by accident as a good way to um, share a message, whatever that is. Um, and what I'm always curious because I find uh, when I talk to people and I talk about censorship or I talk about you know whether it's my story or stories like yours or there's like a group of us that have you know all kind of been hit. It, that and we all knew each other to some extent sure. and uh they there's like some people don't believe like they don't believe that censorship even really exists and right. there's some that um it's almost like they, they don't they don't because they're not working in media they can't really understand kind of what goes down so what i what i'd be curious to do is is sort of from your experience like leading up to your i guess your page deletion what were you guys experiencing in terms of, were you getting any fake news strikes? Were you getting, was this stuff starting to happen to you guys like everybody else? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, absolutely. And I think that's something that needs to be distinguished, right? Because it wasn't just like we were doing well, we were thriving and all of a sudden October, 2018 happened and we yeah. were cut off. We started to kind of see the writing on the wall. Uh, we were starting to see censorship pretty regularly around 2016, 2017, 
nothing of this nature, right? Like nobody really had foreseen the big tech companies taking down large swaths of pages and groups yeah. at a time, right? So right. we were starting to see little strikes here and there. Um, it oftentimes be the, the intellectual property, the copyright stuff, which is even harder to really prove or appeal. And it was starting to kind of add up to the point where it was starting to, to, to be detrimental to our process, to our operation. And it didn't take long until, yeah, we did start to see the reach decline, which didn't right. seem to make sense because we were always told, and this is basically how most people think of how social media works. The more fans and followers you accumulate, the more reach you're going to have. Yeah. And that was the case until about 2015, 2016 or so. And then we started to notice that even though we had, you know, at that point, maybe like 2.9 million fans, our reach was about the same as it was when we had 500,000 fans. Mm -hmm. So we started kind of scratching our head and asking ourselves like, okay, we're investing all this energy into content just so we could grow, just so we could continue to uh, be a larger operation. And at one point we even had ambitions to be something along the lines of like a vice or something, you know, where yeah, we could yeah, yeah. continue to make uh, you know, powerful videos of video content, go to actual, you know, locations, do documentaries, mini docs, that kind of stuff. That was kind of our, our model that we were shooting for, but uh, obviously that didn't last long. And, you know, we, as I said, we saw the writing on the wall by 2017, you know, I was at that point living in uh, Santa Cruz, which uh, is in California. It's, it's a little bit more of a pricey uh, area to live. It's right next to the ocean, but I just happened to grow up there. So after I lived around the state a little bit, I went back to Santa Cruz, but you know, where we were living, it started to kind of dawn on me and my partner that this wasn't going to be sustainable. Like we were going to have to move and get away from that living situation just because, you know, the rent was so high. And so I had started to kind of prepare mentally. Uh, of course, I never could see, I never would have envisioned that our pages would have been taken down completely. But here's the kicker, Joe, is I moved about three hours away to Sacramento to a cheaper house, to a cheaper home. We actually bought our first home, very first time you know, I've ever owned a home. And at that point, I felt secure and comfortable enough in my life where I was at to be able to make that kind of purchase. You know, like, hey, we're going to put some money down for a home. We want to start a family. So I wanted to, uh, you know, eventually have kids. Well, turns out, you know, two weeks after we bought the house, right around mm -hmm. the same time I found out I was going to have my first child, my son, that's when they hit us with the, the deletion of the pages and accounts. So it's been, as I said, a life trajectory changer, um, not only just for me, but for my team, for the website. And uh, yeah, man, it's been a, a grueling process since then, just trying to get back on our feet because the game has changed so much. And part of that isn't necessarily just big tech and what they've done to kind of set up roadblocks and hurdles for us, but it's also just because things have happened, right? Like uh, the whole MAGA movement happened, the, the whole yeah. COVID incident issue happened. So things have grown, things have escalated and our stature in the social media world within the alt media world has slowly declined to the point where other people have kind of taken our place and there's yeah. more movement there within the independent journalism scene. So it's, it's been really tricky, man. Yeah, I want to break down some of that independent journalism scene change stuff in a second, because um, there's sure. some fascinating cultural moments there. But before we get there, you know, it's just so you're you're, you know, you're a, a, a guy who's creating a, a company in essence, and you're you're taking all the right steps. And this this is what I, I love sort of. Um, you know, trying to just, I guess, help people sort of sit in the shoes of, of what it's been like in this industry, um, because people know media is hard, right? And they know sure. it's a cutthroat industry, whatever. But I don't think they sometimes get how um, how difficult it is in independent media, because it's so, in my opinion, it's important that independent media exists. But the level of uncertainty that always exists is is unbelievable right it's like so you know here you are similar to my story like you're building a company it's doing well you're doing everything right right like you're you're taking all the steps you're planning you're probably being smart about what is my company gonna look like in five years um let's hire people and give them jobs and make sure that they are paid well and make sure that they have some sense semblance of job security you know you're, you're trying to plan for having a kid and, and buying a house you're doing all the things right <laughs> and then somebody just comes and just like flips a switch yeah and and your whole life is like is changing and now this is what i find interesting is like it's easy in 2023 
right? To look back and be like, well, this is what happened. But when it actually happened, so you lost your page, right? What were the, what was the next just year like? Just the next year when you lost your page? It was just trying to reestablish where, how do we begin? Where do we start again? Right. How do we, yeah. I mean, how do we get traction? I mean, we're starting from scratch, you know? I mean, we have mm -hmm. the reputation, we have the brand name, but we're starting from scratch all over again. And yeah. it, it wasn't just from scratch, Joe. This is something else that, as I said, this is something that they've been tormenting us, terrorizing us with. So we started the Free Thought Project 2.0. We had right. this clever idea that we would start to, you know, iterate, we would start to name each one. You know, it would be the 3.0 or the 4.0 or whatever. Yeah. So <laughs> every time they ban us, it would look worse and worse for them. You know, that was kind of the, the mindset and the theory behind it. So we started the, the Facebook page, the, three, the Free Thought Project 2.0, and within a month and a half, they took that one down. So we were just starting to kind of get traction again. I think that one got up to about, I don't know, I think it was like 60,000 followers or something in a very short period of time because everybody knew what happened with the purge. Uh, and we, did our, we started a podcast right after that. Uh, to answer your question, that was one of the ways that we figured we could kind of get this information out there without necessarily having the microscope on us. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do everything we can to, to kind of build up again. And, uh, you know, next thing I know, they're taking us down again. And so we appeal that uh, no luck, you know, of course. And they, they hit us with the excuse that, you know, once you're banned from these social media platforms, they really don't want you to create a, another account that's in yeah. the TOS, the terms of service. But, you know, again, like we felt like the the justification, the reasoning behind why they took us down was completely unfair. Uh, they actually gave us three three reasons about that. It was uh, fake accounts, spam, and inauthentic coordinated behavior. And of course, uh, how do they define any, that? Ex how do you define any of those things? They right. were ne they never gave us any proof. Uh, they use spam as this umbrella term, basically to attack anybody who you know they don't want to be on their platform. So. Yeah. Before spam used to be something like in the email world, like somebody would send you like 10 emails in a row or, or junk email and that would be considered spam, right? But now it's become this kind of nebulous term that fits you know, anything that these big tech social media companies don't like will be kind of pushed into that corner. Yeah. So uh, between those three things, we felt like this was unjust, this is unfair. Like we're fighting back. We're gonna push back. We're gonna start a new page. So uh, we did that. They took us down. So we started another one, the Free Thought Project 3.0. Guess what? That one lasted about six months, but they ended up finding the page. They ended up taking it down as well. And uh, so now we're on the Free Thought Project 4.0. Uh, and, and that one, they've actually taken a different approach with. That one's been up since uh, April 2019. And instead of taking us down, because they, I feel like they got smart here. And of course, I have no way to prove this. It's just pure speculation. But I feel like they got smart. They realized if they were going to take us down, that was going to generate a bunch of publicity. That's going to generate a bunch of, uh, you know, people coming and, and following us, supporting us. Every time that they took us down, we could screenshot that. We could share it with our audience on different social media platforms. So now they've taken this different approach with us where they've just banned us, shadow banned us and throttled us into oblivion. Right. So even when we're making viral posts, posts and images and memes that go viral on other social media platforms, they're not getting any traction on Facebook. So to answer your question, Joe, there, there's some things that we can do. You know, we could start all these different uh, accounts and, and new uh, pages on these alt social media platforms. But at the end of the day, there's just not the same reach. There's still right. not the same audience there, you know, and, and they'll be lucky if they have a couple million people on these social media platforms where we were reaching a couple million people per post if it was viral yeah, exactly. on Facebook. Yeah. So there's a huge, you know, difference there. And uh, it's just, as you said, man, it, it, it is extremely uh, difficult. It's challenging. And I don't think enough people really understand what has happened to a, a segment of alt, alt media independent journalists who were starting to change the paradigm. Yeah, I agree. I, I think there is, there's, a, there's a ton of evidence that um, a lot of what was being said by a handful of brands, even as many as like 10 or 15, um, were really making an impact on the way people were thinking and looking at things. Sure. And um, 
you know, when, when people often say, well, you know, we got to move to these other platforms, get off of Facebook, get off of YouTube, get off of Twitter. It's like, we've all tried that, right? Yeah. We've all tried it. Not only that, but I recall there was times where we would, we would do it somewhat in a coordinated effort, right? It would be like, all right, let's all create stuff and see what would happen and, and even announce it to people and, and try and move people over there. And it just never happened. Like people won't, they won't go. Yeah. In fact, that reminds me, you know, you, you asked that great question and we did myself and Derek bros actually did organize uh, United for common ground, alt media summit in Houston, mm -hmm. where we had over 50 journalists, uh, page owners, influencers, uh, all come together so we could kind of put our minds together as to how we can bypass uh, some of the censorship or how we could beat it. And yeah. that was one of the things that we came to the conclusion of was like, okay, minds, minds is a pretty good start yeah. for what we wanted to do, where we wanted to go as a platform. And the, uh, you know, the website owner, Bill Ottman, Bill, he yeah. was, uh, he was on board with the idea. He was in communication with us. So we're like, yes, let's steer everybody over to minds. But even that didn't materialize, even that didn't pan out. We thought we could take all of our audiences over to minds, but that's not the way it worked, unfortunately. And you can even say, okay, so minds bill ended up being on Joe Rogan and yeah. Even with that, I mean, I think he's actually, he went on by himself and then he went on with uh, Daryl Davis. Um, so he's been on That's twice. Right. And even with that, Minds has not grown. And I think this this kind of reveals a very, very fascinating aspect to our psychology as, as humans, as it relates to this question of like how hard it is to get people to move away from something that is so ingrained in, in society. And even people who are so aggressively against um, systems like Google and Facebook and YouTube and, and whatever still can't seem to, um, in enough numbers, move away from it. And, and, you know, we get, um, I don't want to say we get flack, but we get a lot of people, you know, saying like, guys, you should really move away from YouTube and go to rumble. And it's like, look, I'm not, I'm not Russell Brand. I'm not a, I'm not a celebrity. I can't just like take a shit in a bag and put it out there and everyone's going <laughs> to listen to it. Right. It's like, sure. I'm not saying his stuff is bad. His stuff is good. But the point is he has a celebrity, right? He, yes. he has a piece to him that people will, will pay attention to. Whereas, um, you know, for, for us people that are just trying to run brands who have already built, um, highly successful businesses and then had it taken away. It's like, we're looking at it from a standpoint of like, what do we have to do to be sustainable? And, it's really, really hard to move over to Rumble where you'll get a couple hundred views and all of your organic, um, like, uh, what do you call like algorithmic traffic? Like I still get lots of algorithmic traffic on, on YouTube, but if I move to Rumble, I'm basically only getting the traffic that I send there myself. So I'm, I'm sure. limited in my growth and it's, right. it's really, really hard. Uh, I think for the average person to understand that the nature of, of how difficult it is. And then it becomes the question of, Okay, so am I moving over to Rumble just because I want to to keep my business alive and just you know talk to the you know ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand, whatever amount of people who are going to watch it, or is my is my my mission to try and get people that are out there in the public yes. that 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 need to hear different perspectives, but yes. they won't because they don't spend any time on Rumble. You know that's the part that is is also hard about this question. Sure. And not to mention a lot of these smaller social media platforms that basically turn into echo chambers, you know, because mm -hmm. largely the past five years, the right has been more vilified yeah. and has been pushed into some of these smaller uh, alt media platforms. So again, you're still having to contend with maybe not the, the demographic that you want to target, which yeah. I'm right, right there with you, Joe. I, we've continued to stay on Facebook, even though I hate them, even though I can't stand Facebook, <laughs> even though I, I, I can't stand meta in general. But it is a double-edged sword, as you mentioned, yeah. because our work, again, you know, we talk about this as in the context as our business, but that's just one facet of it, right? Like mm -hmm. we're also in the business of trying to open up minds, to share important counterintuitive information, to, you know, quote, awaken the, the general public uh, who are still sleeping. So I want to reach out to those normies. That is my target audience. The people who are on the fence are the people who are going to be the most receptive to the information that we're putting out yeah. there, not the people who are couched in their dogmatic right-wing beliefs or left-wing you know, echo chambers or whatever. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And it has become more and more difficult. And I would say too, a lot of it is it's part of that. Like we as the leaders couldn't completely abandon that last little bit of a revenue stream that we had from these big big tech platforms. But 
I would say just the general public as well isn't quite as apt to just pick up and leave, yeah. you know, a, a whole decade or even more of memories of, uh, you know, all the different posts that they've had, all the pictures that they've uploaded, all the friends that they've networked with and associated with over the years. That's a hard sell. You know, it's yeah. an extremely hard sell. And there's going to be a small fraction of people who will, who will migrate and, and transfer over to these smaller platforms. But the, the large ma percentage, the large majority, the people that we really need the critical mass for the clicks, for the ad revenue, they're not going to do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a very tricky um, conundrum uh, to, to answer, uh, you know, is I think the, the big thing. And I, you know, I'm curious, like, you know, there's a part of this where people uh, are viewing the brand, right? Like the brand free thought project went through banning and deletion, but behind that brand are humans. Right. And, you know, how would you describe how you felt as a person? over, you know, the years leading up to the banning, then the years through it, like how, what was that like for you? Joe, I can't even explain to you how on a daily basis, I felt like I was fulfilling my mission on this earth. I felt like I was on my life path. It, it, nothing could have felt more right to me yeah. when things were thriving, when things were clicking, when we were in our zone. And the fact that I was able to hire seven, eight, nine different activists to work for us full time as writers, as social media team members, that was so something that I was so proud of. That was something mm -hmm. that very much empowered me. It gave me confidence. It made me feel like I was doing something with my life. I was moving in the right direction. So um, I really have to be careful to not like cross that line into like getting emotional right now because it really has been devastating. You know, yeah. like it really has. Yeah. And I'm it's so it, so much so that. I'm seriously considering next week writing up a different business plan for a different business because I, I can't continue to do this. Like I right. know we were talking behind the scenes, but I'm not even breaking even doing this anymore. I'm actually losing money. Doing yeah. it. I'm paying money to continue doing this work. And that's just not a sustainable life plan. You know, I can't yeah. continue to do that, especially because I, you know, I shared with you as well. I have two kids, two young kids, you know, so I, I have to do something else with my life. And to me, that's just absolutely heartbreaking because this was something I loved this is something I was passionate about. This is something I was good at. And the market signals that I would see on a daily basis on these yeah. big tech platforms reassured me that is exactly what I was supposed to be doing. And I know yeah. the same could go for what you guys were doing with Collective Evolution as well. I, I know our, our mission statement was maybe a little bit different, but we we're very much on the same page. And I know you guys are reaching millions and millions of people as well. So the fact that they've turned all this on it, its head, uh, I remember times... And just to harken back to, you know, sentimental memory here just for a second. But I remember looking at our pages and being like, wow, like millions of views. Like I think in 2017, we had like 800,000 views or excuse me, 800 million views. We were close to a billion views yeah. just that one year. <laughs> and then I would go to something like NBC, their Facebook page, and it would be dead. You know, it'd be quiet. There'd be, they would have zero <laughs> likes, you know, maybe one or two shares, maybe one or two comments. And then they flipped everything around. Around that same yeah. time, around 2017, you know, they took down Alex Jones, but then they flipped everything around where it was like all of a sudden these, you know, corporate media pages were getting a bunch of traction. They were getting views. They were getting uh, shares and we were starting to see less and less and less. And it didn't make sense, but that's when they started to kind of manipulate the algorithms. And it, it makes sense now. And of course we know that now. Yeah. 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 It's, it's wild. Cause it's like, you know, um, it, uh, you know, I'm not trying to make it out like we've had like the hardest lives in the world or anything, oh, but yeah, it's, of it's, not. it's like, it's like that type of thing where it's like the way, the way you described like the feeling I remember from, from like 2009 to probably, you know, 20, 2017, like the beginning, maybe the first few months of 2017, I, I, it, it certainly did feel like, you know, you're, you're doing what you love yeah. and, and it's working and you're making an impact, you're making a difference. And like you said, this is what I find so fascinating about this story. It's not like you're moving up in the music industry, for example, and um, and uh, and then people just didn't like your next album. Right. And then so you fell off. That's <laughs> yeah. not what happened. It sure. was you're moving up in the music industry. You're the, the most selling, you know, or amongst the top 10 selling artists. And then somebody comes and says, uh, just so you know, um, you're not allowed to make music anymore. 
Or and if you sure. and if you want to, um, we're gonna put you over there in that corner, and you're just not allowed to reach any of the audience you've built anymore. It's just we're we're stopping what you're yeah. doing for no yeah. reason other than you're just not allowed anymore. And that and that's what's so hard, right? Is it's like I, I don't even know how to put it into words, and I've tried and I've bawled about it many times over myself. Sure. Yeah. But it's like you try to put into words the feeling of like you're doing something that's in your heart and soul. And yeah. you're just you're just not allowed to do it, and you don't know why, and you can't talk to anybody who's telling you no. The people who are telling you no won't talk to you. Yeah, yeah. And it's like you're just like what? <laughs> and again, I'm sure there are there are difficult, more difficult experiences on this sure. planet. Sure, but sure. I'm just saying, it's like this is what society is at the moment, right? It's it's people deciding what you are or you're not allowed to do. And people don't even seem to realize like this is what's going on in media. Right. Yeah. You know, in, in the States growing up and, you know, I'm in my early forties now, there was always this concept of this like American dream, you know, mm -hmm. of like pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, like building something from, from scratch and, you know, being proud of it, like really working to get it and really getting there and like having that as a success, like, you know, notch on your belt or something. Yeah. But that seemed to be non-existent, that mentality when we were taken down and it was almost like nobody cared. Like it didn't seem to matter to anybody within uh, the media, the mainstream media, the, the corporate media that we had built these organizations from scratch we weren't starting as some kind of cnn yeah. subsidiary or something you know like <laughs> we're starting from scratch we started from absolutely nothing from the tools that were free in front of us yeah and we built something out of nothing yeah. i think that deserves some type of pat on the back or praise and i'm so glad you had that caveat joe because it's true like much more people have much more difficult lives than we have right we're just complaining about this kind of this whatever this freak sub niche that happened to be <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. very insignificant to a large majority of the people but there was a small majority of the people that found it very significant you know yeah but i would say yeah as you had mentioned like the big tech platforms gave us this opportunity basically i have this analogy where they gave us this garage to build our own supercar Hold on, my cat's trying to get up here not right now bronco <clears throat> They gave us this uh, this garage to build our supercar, and we invested five years of our lives working every single day, day in, day out. I mean, we always had fresh content, six articles a day, at least two to three new memes a day, sometimes two to three videos a week. So we were building the supercar. We had it basically all finished, had the rims all done, everything was polished, and then all of a sudden, somebody comes in who owned the garage and was like, oh, thank you. You built this supercar for us. All these people came to our garage to uh, see your supercar. But actually what you get is this Razor scooter that's in the trunk, beep, 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 you know, and like, <laughs> here, you get this Razor scooter and that supercar that you built, just uh, we're gonna take it to the, you know, the whatever, to, the, to the, the demolition or whatever. So it has been, yeah, quite humbling. And uh, it's just so, tough to really every day it's something that i think about on a yeah. daily basis it's something i still have to contend with and you know we've this has been a few years now this was like four years ago but it continues to meander it continues to manifest in ways that rear its ugly head and almost like a trauma victim it's like yeah. i almost have ptsd every time i have some type of issue with fact checkers or some type of censorship that feels unfair it's like oh here we go again well you know? to, to be fair i mean uh I would, I mean, I, I, I spent last year, I spent, I, I mean, I've been studying trauma, studying nervous system health for three years now, um, getting certified, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, by nature, I also spent time with a somatic practitioner hmm. because yeah, I became burnt out and what you would call, I mean, a traumatized physiology, right? Which is just to say excessive levels of stress that don't go away as you're trying to survive, create a survival based physiology that that is what is called by definition, your your, your physiology trauma is traumatized, right? So yeah, people can say, Oh, trauma is only if you witness somebody getting murdered or cut open. That's that's not what trauma is. Um, but the, the general point is, is it's like, it's I would think it's absolutely, you know, accurate to suggest that, you know, the experience of doing it's like, it's like you, you get something deleted or something gets your business gets taken away from you, then you're on quicksand, right? Yeah. Because we had the choice, let, let's be fair, both you and I had the choice to just 
walk away from our businesses entirely uh, and do whatever. We had the some choice, people right? Did. Right, and some people did. And I know lots of people who did. Um, and but we chose like, hey, fuck, we like we built this, and we chose to stay, and we chose to keep doing it. And that choice came with the fact that it's like you're just on quicksand all the time. You don't yes. know what you're doing is right. Yes. You don't know if what you're doing is wrong. It certainly isn't like objectively wrong. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but somebody is deciding that it's wrong. And it's like this ultimate form of gaslighting that goes on for year after year after year after year. And you just, you, you're living in this like, like carnival. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't know what is right or wrong. And so it's like, of course, you're going to end up feeling uh, triggered or, or, you know, by, by fake news. But what my feeling was like, you'd wake up in the morning sometimes and you would get like a fake news strike and like all of your revenue and traffic's gone. And like, yeah, you, you, my stomach would like drop. Right. And then every time it like, it feels like it's going to happen, even when it's an accident or it's a mistake. Like sometimes these, these companies make mistakes. Right. Right. And, but you still, you go through that visceral biological reaction. It, it's, it's there. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you pointed out the, the kind of lack of foundation to stand on because I often yeah. feel that way as well. And not just from the uncertainty of what my business is going to be tomorrow or the next week or how I'm going to feed my children in a month, but because the content itself doesn't get a fair shake anymore. Right, so right. you don't even know if your content is resonating exactly. with your audience. So you don't know if you're actually creating yeah. content. And again, there are indicators, you know, you could post it on maybe some other social media platform and maybe you'll see it gets a little bit more likes and a little more shares than somewhere else. But that to me was very important because I wanted to always be putting out the most powerful most engaging uh, information that resonates with our audience as possible. So yeah. to me to not know if I am actually able to, you know, continuously put out the information, it almost puts you in this position where you start to doubt yourself and you're like, well, am I just maybe, did I lose it? Do I not have the magic <laughs> exactly. anymore? Like, yeah. am, am I just not as good as I once was? Like, am I not reading, you know, the, the, the market signals the way I was? Am I out of the loop? Like all these things start to enter into your head. And I almost feel, Joe, like that is intentional because they yeah. want us to feel that way. It's part of the PSYOP. It's part of uh, the, the reverse engineering of all this and trying to make us feel like we're alone, make us feel like we're not being effective in our work, trying to make us feel like we're not getting anywhere. And, you know, of course, this is speculative again. This is, you know, putting my tinfoil hat on, but it sure yeah. feels like that is the game plan. And it often is effective. Like I do feel that way occasionally more often than not, to be honest. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when you, I, I go through the same thing where it's like you put out something that you spend a lot of time on and then you don't get enough feedback because it won't be shown to anybody. And so you're not sure, um, like you're like, yeah, this resonates with my heart and I feel like this is the right thing to do. But, um, I also am running a business and if this isn't going to get eyeballs, it doesn't matter how much I'm writing it. Um, yeah. if it isn't going to get an eyeballs, then I have to start saying to myself, well, then maybe this becomes a hobby and I, I go get a job somewhere else. In which case, this is what, what, what oftentimes people will say is like, well, you know, you could just keep doing this and go get a job. It's like, yeah, but then the level of impact independent media can make and have is going to diminish dramatically because if I'm going through that and you're going through that, and we already know a ton of other colleagues that are going through that, it's like how many people are going to get eliminated from the independent media sphere before sure the amount of impact that is had is, is wiped out. Right. And I think this is, this is often what gets missed is it's easy to look at one of us and say, well, yeah, you could just, you know, give up and go get a job. Right. And it's like, well, of course that's true. That's a choice we can make, but now start applying that to everybody. Yep. And then yep. now you've, you've, you've eliminated independent media and you're back at where you started before the internet, which is there's very little independent media, mainstream media rules, rules the show. And, you know, and so it's like, there's like this importance of, and I, I actually find this to be the case is like the people that are, um, sort of very safe in the independent media sphere. So like the people that are, um, very much just playing the political game, they're still very right leaning or very left leaning, but they bring in different perspectives. There's a lot of financial support uh, for that kind of stuff compared to people that are saying, Hey, maybe we should think beyond. Um, yeah. going back, going back to Ron Paul, right. Yeah. One yeah. of his big things was to audit the fed, right. And to, uh, talk about how the federal reserve was a, a core to a societal challenge that existed. Like it fed the way the fed operated fed, uh, uh, sorry, um, fueled the uh, possibility of corruption all the way through. 
it, it yeah. fueled uh, oppression. It fueled the ability for powerful people to control through debt the entire population, right? So he was trying to say, let's let's think deeper, right? And sure. to me, that's what I think a lot of us in independent media that are not as well supported per se at the moment, um, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to think a little deeper and and, and it's hard, you know? It is indeed. And I would say those of us who are politically homeless and intentionally so, of course, because I'm not trying to be either on the left or the right, we don't have any representation from the mainstream or politicians, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for a couple of years now, we've seen the politicians on the right, the Republicans talk about the censorship, talk about the slanted views within big tech, but nobody's standing up for the anarchists or, you know, the, the people who are the political atheists, the people who are in the middle. So that, as you suggested, that does increase, you know, our difficulty that makes things even that much more difficult and presents another hurdle for us. And I don't think a lot of people actually understand how much work we put into producing the content that we produce, because to be honest, man, like if I'm going to even make a meme, a one meme could sometimes take up to two, three hours. I have to find the right images. I have to get the wording correctly. Not a, I have to edit it all. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it and not to mention, you know, the return on investment for videos. I mean, putting, yeah. putting together a video that may or may not flop after spending eight hours on it isn't the best return on investment. You know, like <laughs> if it can flop, that's not a very smart, you know, choice of use of time. So, and unfortunately, as you said, Joe, like what's the opposite of all media? Well, it's corporate media. What's the yeah. you know opposite of the independent journalism? Well, it's corporate journalism. Do we need more of that? Do we want more of that? I don't think so. I wouldn't suggest that we do. We've made great strides over the past, you know, 20 plus years now that everybody's had, you know, a smartphone in their pocket to actually wake people up. And we've seen that we've seen a, a percentage of, you know, the population who's actually started to question things. And that wouldn't have been the case if the internet wasn't something that we've had in our back pocket all this time. Yeah. So I think, yeah, to, you know, present that question to your audience and anybody who happens to be listening to this, like if you're not actively supporting alt media and independent journalism, you're basically saying, okay, I'm fine with corporate media running amok, dominating narratives and basically running the show. So, yeah. uh, you know, if that's what you want, then by all means, guys, like don't continue to support us. But I know that, you know, there are a lot of good people who do as well. And I don't want to discredit them because I know you have subscribers. I have subscribers and there's plenty of people who, you know, dip into their pockets just to keep us going. So I'm not saying yeah. that they don't exist, but and a, a larger majority would certainly put us in a place where we could be much more sustainable and actually have that foundation as we were just talking about to continue to move forward. Yeah, I think what's tough is that the game has changed so much it through what you were talking about, the intentionality, right? Like yep. it, if it's not it's not hard to realize that if you take somebody and you you force them into thinking that they can't survive because of that's what you're like you're constantly taking away what they're what they have and what they're building, that eventually it will wear people out. It'll destroy people, right? It, and I think that's what the hard part is, is it's like you know, corporate media has, you know, obviously tons of funding and, you know, and then there's people that who, who want to support corporate media because they, they enjoy it. And that's, that's their, their choice. Um, independent media is, is it's hard because it, corporate fund, uh, like getting money from, from companies for sponsorships for this, that, whatever is a lot harder. Number one. And number two, it's like some people don't want to go that route. Um, and then not to mention that at this moment, we're kind of also competing with a lot of celebrities. And that's, that's a piece to the puzzle. That's, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I got, I'm, I like, I'm, it, it's tricky because it's like on one hand, I, I think this idea of sort of intentionally pushing people to the max is, is reminds me a lot of a corporate strategy that exists in, in some corporations, big, big corporations when they're not sure what to do with an older, um, an older employee that, that doesn't really have a role in the company anymore, but they can't really fire them very easily. Mm -hmm. They, they do something called like retiring the person in place, meaning mm -hmm. what they're trying to do is give this person so either so little to do or make their job so uncomfortable that they get up and leave. Yeah. And, 
I, I, I explained this before in a video that I did. I think you might've seen it at some point where I was kind of showing all the graphs and all the different things of like how Google and how these companies have taken our revenue. Like the famous one is the AdSense one where it's like, you're expected to make $5,000. Like all the data says, hey, we made $5,000 that month or whatever. Then, you know, at the end of the month, you get paid like $100 and you're like, well, where'd all the money go? Yeah. And but But they don't tell you that they took away all your money. Like you have to like check your books at the end of the year and realize like, wait, what, where the hell's all the money? Like what happened? Right. Um, and that is like, they're making your life a living hell on purpose. They know what they're doing because you can't contact them. You can't ask them questions. You can't do it. They're just making your life hell. And it's been, this mistake has never happened for like 10 years. And then all of a sudden it just starts happening and it gets worse and worse and worse. It has to be intentional. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I remember when you were dealing with that. I, I'm pretty sure we were communicating back and forth, and we ended up about a month or two later had the same issue with Google, where mm-hmm. they were telling us, "Yeah, well, you have a 4K coming this month." Well, actually, that turned into you know 1800 because of invalid traffic. Invalid traffic. Whatever that means, right? So they could go ahead and invent terms. And uh, I remember we reached out to them. We wouldn't. We weren't getting any straight answers back. You know, and again, you know. It, it's very difficult to actually you know, talk to somebody, very yeah. difficult. It's even more difficult to, excuse me, I just got that mixed up. It's, it's difficult to reach out to anybody, get an email response. It's even more difficult to talk to anybody. Yeah. So we ended up just having to change ad companies. Yeah. And on that, I think it was just up until maybe a couple months ago, but like Meta and Alphabet, uh, they were dominating the ad market as well. I think they had something like a 70% share of the ad market, the digital ad market, which is, yeah. A three hundred billion dollar market, and and actually, I just saw a couple of days ago. I, I made a note here, but apparently, they finally have started to lose some of their dominance of the U.S. digital ad market. Uh, it's the first time since twenty fourteen that they're not going to hold the majority share of the market. So, mm. I mean, that just also goes to show another thing that we're up against. Because I'm sure, like you, we that was a prominent primary primary uh, source of revenue was the ad rev. And yeah. so once that started to change and started to become more uh, monopolized by these these two big tech companies, we started to see a, a steep decline in, in revenue and ad revenue. So, uh, yeah, this is and hopefully what this indicates is finally uh, the people's frustration and their threshold of patience finally coming to an end with yeah. Facebook. And even uh, yesterday, I saw a New York Times article that said, um, Facebook's bridge to nowhere. So they're getting hit by, you know, the corporate media as well. I, I think they've rubbed uh, the corporate media wrong in, in many ways. And obviously, you know, we're, we have our guns out. We're, we're definitely aiming at big tech as well, doing everything we can to delegitimize them and point out all the, the holes, you know, in their philosophy and their actions and everything. So hopefully this is starting to indicate that the end of Facebook's dominance, but even still, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to tell, you know, and we're, yeah. Where do they go? You know, where do where do people go from here if they're not going to be on Facebook? Is it is it TikTok? You know, is it Twitter? Yeah, yeah. I think the challenge is like a lot of the social media engines in general are, um, they're hard to be on. Like TikTok, I I don't find very much, if any, value on TikTok. Um, I don't use it, but I I've, I've tried, and right, it's just very you. very difficult to be there. Instagram's becoming very difficult to be on. Um, sure. it's just not. I don't know. It's just not enjoyable and, um. I'm seeing Substack grow. I think there's some there's some value there. I think there's an True. ecosystem that's building there. I was actually talking with another colleague of ours, and we were talking about how um, Substack kind of has this feeling a little bit of like this uh, collaborative ecosystem that kind of existed way back in the day when we all started on Facebook and we we're all kind of doing that stuff. And um, maybe maybe there's something there. Maybe not. I don't know. It it, it has somewhat of an, a more enjoyable and fun spirit similar yeah. to to back in the Facebook days but um who knows right and and Substack has its investors sure and i was going to say like who's to say amazon and uh you know what was the other big one uh their their the the server hosting you know the same thing that they did to plat the to parlor they de platform parlor you know yeah. and uh to a certain extent they they took off the uh, parlor app from the app store and they were starting to, to issue threats and stuff. So there is kind of like a undercurrent of control still, even with some of these, uh, you know, smaller alt media platforms, yeah. there's still 
a possibility that they could be taken down if they're not playing ball, you know? I mean, yeah. um, so yeah, it, it's a, it's a challenging time. Yeah. I mean, we've, as, as media companies, we've all had to pivot a lot. Um, we've had to come up with different things. And, and I think, um, you know, part of the reason why, it, you know, we still sit here sort of scratching our heads at times is because it's like, we've tried every solution possible at, at different points and we've pivoted and we've tried different approaches and, um, you know, you, 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 know, you change your attitude about it. You change your focus about it. You, you, you know, you do what you got to do and in some way or another, it's still something else happens and, and, and something else gets in the way. And it's, and it's really, it's just, it's challenging. It's a challenging sure. thing, but, um, I do want to kind of go into, you know, a lot of times when, when these stories come out, people will say, well, why don't you sue, you know, Facebook, Google, the fact checkers and so on and so right. forth. And, sure. um, you know, some people have been there, done that, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But, um, obviously that's way harder than, than it sounds. Um, but you know, I, I know you have a couple of cases of people who've tried to do this, who've tried to sue a fact checker or, you know, a platform and, uh, why don't you just share kind of yeah, what happened? Well, sure. Absolutely, Joe. I'd love to. So, I mean, it's all kind of started over a, a tweet that I made in mid-November and I basically, it just hit the wall. Like I got to a point where I was like, okay, like they just fact check me for this. There's no legitimate reason for them to fact check me on this. This has to be an al algorithm error. So, uh, of course the, the culprit was science feedback and, mm -hmm. um, Science feedback, if you look on the internet, they have a terrible reputation. In fact, a couple of the lawsuits I'm about to talk about involve science feedback. So I automatically knew I was up against like a, a formidable foe, but I figured, let me just go ahead and, and read the tweet here because uh, I, I wanna give a little context, but I made a, a point that uh, there was a new, uh, there was a new, uh, vaccine that they're coming out with Pfizer and Moderna. We're just making, they're making a new vaccine for both COVID and the flu. So mm -hmm. I thought that was a little strange, you know, I was like, Oh, it seems interesting. I'm sure my audience would like to hear about it. So this is the tweet word for word. Turns out Pfizer and Moderna are making a combination MRNA vaccine for both COVID and the flu. Remember in 2020, you'd be banned for saying COVID was basically the flu. Now, now they will profit from both. So I got hit with first uh, a missing context label on that, which I thought was a little strange. So I appealed it and just a tip to the wise, anytime you get any type of fact check, always appeal it. You just have to email the fact checking company and albeit they don't have much incentive to actually overturn it, but occasionally, occasionally they will actually overturn it if you provide some context or if you bend the knee and do what they say and change the caption or give some kind of context, <laughs> basically saying like, they were right, the fact checkers were right, I was wrong. So I reached out to Science Feedback and I figured because this topic was such a point of contention in 2020 that they didn't want you to conflate both COVID and the flu as being the same thing. It was like a really big point. They, they really didn't want you to do that. They really wanted you to fear COVID. They didn't want you to say it was just the flu. I knew that I made a point to not make that that exact phrase in anywhere in my tweet or in my caption. So I figured this was just an algorithmic error. Like it was just something that they ac accidentally made a mistake about. If I email the fact checking company, they'll realize that I didn't use those words. I never made that point. That wasn't my intention. Well, this was the response that I got back from science feedback and uh, they said, upon reviewing your posts, we found the statement Remember in 2020, you'd be banned for saying COVID was basically the flu. Viewed in the wider context of the post implies that COVID-19 and the flu are indeed the same. The post refrains from stating this claim explicitly, but this is a logical implication based on the post's use of rhetorical, rhetorical technique of just asking questions. So that's basically a lot of jargon and doublespeak to basically say that they knew my intentions of that post. And even though I, the author of the post who made it, never actually said that the flu and COVID are the same thing, that the way that I phrased it was basically implying it's the same thing. So therefore they continued to uphold the, in fact, it changed from being missing context to false magically. So as you know, Joe, a missing context strike isn't really that big of a deal. It doesn't actually 
uh, puts you lower in the, the news feed. Uh, they don't even count it as a strike, but it just goes up on the post and you get the little label there. Well, that's not what the false strike label does. The false mm-hmm. strike label actually reduces your your distribution and all the other litany of things that come along with it. You know, you can't uh, do the subscriptions, you can't X, Y, and Z on Instagram. Yeah. So it gets, it gets to be pretty detrimental. So I had basically, I was like, dude, this is too much. Like I cannot deal with these people anymore. Like I have to do something. I have to push back. I don't care what it means. I need to do something to push back against these people and stop them because it's clear to me, it's plain as day. I'm not trying to put out false information and they're going to intentionally manipulate my wording and you know turn it into a word salad of whatever they want it to be. So that pissed me off. So I reached out to about four different lawyers and all of them were like libertarian, anarcho-capitalist lawyers that just happened to be on my friends list. I, I put out a post and a few people reached back. One of them happened to be a friend. And so I started kind of talking to some of them and one of them in particular was like, hey, look, like, you're probably not the best candidate for several reasons. And one being because you were already kicked off and it's part of their TOS that you can't come back on afterward. But there's all these other cases that have already kind of happened that are kind of either playing out or have already gone through the courts and not none of them have really yielded any positive results. You know, none of them have really gotten pushed the ball much more forward towards free speech. So uh, a handful of them, you know, just to, to name them off, there was the John Stossel case. Uh, he's currently uh, a reporter for Reason. He's also best known for um, ABC's 2020. And I think he was on Fox News for a little bit. But he ended up losing his defamation case with Meta and Science Feedback after he claimed um, that the policy, that he, he claimed that policy, California policy was responsible for the wildfires were happening a few years back and not global warming, which science feedback suggested was the case. And so he ended up yeah, taking it to the courts and ended up losing. And to me, this is the, the interesting part here, okay? So the US judge, the US district judge, Virginia DiMarchi found that Facebook couldn't have defamed Stossel because its fact check program reflects a subjective judgment about the accuracy and reliability of assertions made in the content that's been checked. So simply because the process by which content is assessed and the label is applied called a fact check does not mean that the assessment itself is an actionable statement of objectable fact. <laughs> How crazy is that, Joe? Yeah. Like that blows yeah. my mind. Right, so, so now you have to think, okay, so you're a user on the internet and for all intents and purposes, you believe that if Facebook has fact checked something, that it is actually a fact check. That's why it's called a fact check, right? Right. So, yeah. you know, you have this situation where now the courts are saying, yeah, but everybody knows it's not actually fact checking. It's just subjective. It's like, well, the problem is, is 90% of people walking around on this earth don't think that it's, you know, subjective. Yeah. They yeah. think it's an actual fact. And this is what I find so hilarious is this incongruency between the law and what the law is willing to support in terms of, you know, somebody's protection around defamation and what actual society believes and says, right? And, and this to me is, is goes back to, you know, the spirit of the law, right? Like sure. the spirit of the law is under common sense, right? Um, to protect people from being wrongfully harmed based on somebody else's opinion. And obviously I mean, we've all been through it. We've all seen it. We've all had our name dragged through the mud. We've all had Wikipedia pages created about us that are hateful. Um, and that has a huge impact that that's impacted my business relationships. I've people have not done things with me because they looked on and saw Wikipedia said bad things about me and, sure. and they believed it to be true. Yeah. Um, and yet the courts are upholding this. Like this yeah. is wild. It's wild. So there was another part too. Um, so following the, the lead of other federal courts that have issued identical rulings, DiMarchi concluded that fact checking is a subjective undertaking and neither Facebook nor its third-party reviewers can be liable for defamation because they're not making statements of objective fact, she found. I mean, isn't that what the fact checkers are supposed to be? I mean, people like us, we understand like they're not the arbiters of truth. Like they can't be the arbiters of truth. There's no such thing as an arbiter of truth. Like we could try to put our best version of truth forward, right? And, And corroborate that with facts and evidence and logic and reason. But 
you know, at the end of the day, like things, information exchange is biased one way or another, right? There's going to be some type of bias. So basically they're saying like, well, these people, yeah, it's just subjective and everything that they put forth is subjective, but that again, isn't what the people think. And that in a, in a way is misleading. It's a misnomer, you know, and uh, ultimately what these people end up being is just uh, subjective imperta- subjective interpretation to hide their malicious censorship for political bias, you know, yeah. and that's what it comes down to. And yeah. uh, there, now there's a huge industry of fact checkers, you know, mm-hmm. like basically why not? Right. Like sign up to be a fact checker. You have the credentials. They're handing out money. These big tech companies are handing out money. You, yeah. All you have to do is put forth a subjective opinion, uh, maybe put in some, you know, some jargon in there that sounds halfway intelligent. And you could just basically format every post as your subjective interpretation of the information that you're looking at, you know, yeah. and that's what I dealt with when I had my last tweet fact checked. I mean, that was a subjective interpretation. There was nowhere in the wording of that tweet that says the flu and COVID are the same exact thing. Yeah. So you know, at the end of the day, like how honest is this, you know, like how much right. truth, how much value are they actually bringing the people? They're not. And it's so deceptive. What they're doing is actually acting as a proxy for these companies and corporations who one way through another, they're associated with or have some type of incentive to protect. And and to me, I mean, this is something that we should be screaming from the rooftops about, you know, raising the web red flags and waving them endlessly because this is insane. Yeah. And it's interesting because the courts think it's subjective, yet uh, certain people in, in society are, are actually saying, well, the government needs to um, continue to, to handle misinformation. That's the job of the government. Yep. And you go, okay, so hold on a second. The Twitter files just revealed that you know governments during the course of COVID-19 uh, co- cooperated, well, I guess forced big tech to cooperate with their narratives. Yeah. that turned out to be false, right? So in a sense, those people who are calling for the government to take over misinformation already have examples of how the government handled misinformation and they were wrong about it, right? So in the in in this last little bit, we know that the government should not be given this responsibility, not just from a philosophical point of view, which we could argue sure. all day long, but from an actual evidence-based point of view, they fucked up bad, right? Yeah. They They blew it. And yet they're still saying, no, the government should be responsible for this, right? And I just, I don't know, I'm fascinated by this. And and it's just because I think people are misinterpreting what this whole discussion of misinformation and fact-checking is really about. Yeah. And it's like, yes, there's some, there's some shitty stuff on the internet. There's no doubt about it. But I, this, this war is being had in a, in a narrative from a narrative warfare perspective sure you know, that's really what's happening uh, um, that's exactly yeah. why i'm <laughs> yeah. wearing this hat today man because yeah. it's the truth i mean we are me more veterans you know and uh yeah I, I agree completely i mean i would even go a step further and say that they're actively putting out misinformation i mean they're saying yeah. that we are you know but that, that's actually what they're doing and the same thing applied to when we were banned you know they said that we were uh you know inauthentic coordinated behavior you know and, and right. spam and fake accounts yeah. and it's like Inauthentic coordinated behavior basically means we were too good at our job. Like we were networking with people like you, the Mind Unleashed, anti-media, and doubling, tripling sometimes our network reach. And so that's inauthentic coordinated behavior. It's not like none of farms, you know, like none of it. Yeah. None of it went against their terms of service. None of them. Nothing was wrong. It was literally, uh, hey, I just shared something. Can you share it? Yeah, no problem on your page. And it just, right. Whereas because corporate media is always uh, competing with each other constantly and they can't do that. Sure. Um, you know, yeah, the exactly. In, the exactly. independent, the independent media is seen as collaborators. Um, you know, <laughs> that's a problem, right? Using the tools that they gave us, you know, the exactly. share button, uh, why yeah. let us create more than one page if we weren't supposed to have more than one page, you know, that right. was another thing is they took us all down and we can't forget too, Joe, that they couched all this in the Russia narrative hub. Oh, okay? of course. Yeah. And all this came out at, at eventually as being coordinated with the Atlantic Council and the yeah. di- digital forensic lab research and all these different kind of behind the scene, like uh, NATO whitewashing think tanks and stuff. So this is all connected to the deep state more or less. And that was actually stuff that we had kind of uncovered and unearthed directly after we were taken down because 
um, we, we started to see that there was parallels within Facebook. There was a bunch of people who worked at Facebook that also had government positions. So there was like a Facebook to government revolving door. Um, and there's still people, you know, there's still a handful of people that Facebook had what they called the war room for a while where mm -hmm. they were actively uh, trying to engage and take down quote misinformation and people like ourselves. And then of course the Russia narrative, which is collapsing and has collapsed over yeah. the past year. Yeah. And uh, I, in fact, I just read another uh, report just this morning that said the 2016 election was barely even influenced by the, the Russian provocateurs yeah. or whatever. So, I mean, all this stuff is falling it was on influenced face. by Facebook and Google. But yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but at the end of the day, that doesn't make much of a difference now, five years later. Right. And, you know, the damage is done. They got their way with the cover and, and false facade that they needed, the veneer, you know, and we're here, you know, asking what happened to our business that we built from scratch, you know? Right. So, right. Um, but yeah, there's, there's more cases too. There was Candace Owens's uh, case where, and, and forgive me, I'm looking at some notes here just because there was so much to remember, but uh, basically uh, she was suing US to, USA Today for a, a lawsuit and uh, lead stories. That's another one. They're some mm -hmm, of the worst. Mm -hmm. uh, XCNN, I, I believe is the, uh, the guy who founded that. And, um, Basically, she was trying to uh, put out information that they claimed was downplaying the severity of COVID, and uh, they dismissed it. They, they basically said there wasn't any uh, feasible grounds for her to stand on. Um, another one is uh, James O'Keefe, and he had filed a defamation lawsuit against Twitter after Project Veritas literally had just published um, an expose um, which was highlighting critical statements from CNN, uh, I guess, employees, basically mm -hmm. saying that they had, they were the ones who made sure that Trump was, wasn't reelected. And yeah. hours later, uh, his personal Twitter account was taken down. However, the lawsuit was like directly aimed at several CNN anchors, including Brian Stelter, who basically called the group like very controversial conservatives and basically like tried to put them in the corner saying that they violated multiple rules on the site. So like Project Veritas demanded a retraction from CNN and they didn't, they didn't retract it. So um, they ended up suing, Project Veritas ended up suing. Um, but then more or less, uh, let's see, US District Judge Steve C. Jones found the distinction would not be significant enough to rise the level rise to the level of a defamation case. So basically like the defamation yeah. wasn't significant enough and that was one of the things that I ran into as well, talking to the, the handful of lawyers that I talked to. First of all, they told me that there isn't, there, there's just really isn't a legal path forward because nobody's yeah. really traversed this and the people who have, haven't really got anywhere. So there's a lot of legal gray area. Also, the big tech lawyers are very aggressive. Yeah. Um, I, I talked to a lawyer directly after the 2018 purge, a big, big name lawyer. He was helping Dennis Prager from uh, PragerU, who was taking on Google at the time. But we were trying to focus on Facebook because they were the people who took us down. And he was basically backing out. Like he was intimidated because the Facebook lawyers were just so aggressive that yeah. he felt like there was no chance that we could actually mount a legal campaign that was significant. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's just a lot of problems with trying to actually do something in the legal realm. Uh, and just to wrap this up really quick, one lawyer basically told me that if there was a way that you could actually prove that there was a government employee, a government agent who was facilitating the censorship of your content, like meaning actively reaching out to Twitter, Facebook, coordinating, cooperating with them, and basically saying like, take these people down, then you'd actually have probably a, a way to get your foot in the door uh, get the discovery to look into the behind the scenes, you know, emails or whatever was happening yeah. and actually might have some ground to stand on uh, for a legitimate lawsuit. But otherwise, it's going to cost millions of dollars, probably take a few years and it'll be a slog. You know, it's going to yeah. take, take forever. Yeah. And, and this and that leads back to it's almost impossible for us to have any recourse. And I've 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 done a little bit of digging on the legal side as well, similar to what you did. And was told like it's defamation cases are just so hard because you have you have such a, 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 a uh, you need so much proof the the uh, the scale of proof that you require and it has is is huge 
Yeah. And the problem is, is these things are sl a slow beat down of your brand over time. Not like, not like, for example, it could be as simple as with collective evolution at the time, we'd have like a handful of websites who've just writ wrote and written complete nonsense about us. Mm -hmm. And those websites will rank higher than I think collective evolution because of the way Google discriminated against our uh, domain. So you end up in a situation where it's like, it's hard to show that it was that person or that person or this person. It was a combination of factors, including sure. the fact that we get hidden and all of the defamation gets pushed up to the top, yeah. right? From multiple sources. So there's like, it's just a, it's a really, really difficult situation. But, um, you know, this kind of leads in a little bit into sort of the Twitter files. And, and I remember way at the beginning when Elon was um, looking at taking it over, there was this discussion of, um, you know, well, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. It, 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 it's probably an agenda. And it's like, I get that. I get that. It's like, you know, somebody could make the argument that it's an agenda for Elon to take over Twitter, or whatever. But I said, you know what, if it's not right. And, and this is a possibility where we're all going to learn really how these big tech companies work inside out. Like this could be huge. And I, I got, fuck, I got destroyed for making that video back. In the day. <laughs> People were like, dude, you're crazy. Like you're falling for it. You're an yep. Elon fanboy, all this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? I really don't think it's the case. And look at the Twitter files. Right. Yeah. The Twitter yeah. files have like like Elon or not, the, the Twitter files have provided uh, an opportunity for people to learn what was going on. And it's the, the exact thing you just mentioned, which is we're probably going to get to some degree uh, proof of government employees who were working to censor all these accounts. Right. Sure. Maybe yeah. this turns into something bigger. Maybe this scares other big tech corporations. Maybe this behavior is finally going to stop because of, of what's going on with the Twitter files. And, you know, I, I know some people are, are turning around and saying, well, you know, that don't forget, that's part of the plan. Part of the plan is, is that all of us need to not trust institutions anymore. Then the Great Reset will come in and, and propose a new plan. It's like, yeah, but like, like, how are you differentiating exposing the elite and oh but you're supposed to expose the elite so the great reset can come like so it's just it's like it's a it's a zero-sum game with sure. people you you can never win it's, yeah. it's you know everything is always bad <laughs> it's like i don't but i'm curious your thoughts on the twitter files yeah i don't get why people are downplaying it as well i mean i think many of us speculated that this was happening but this is legitimate proof i mean here's the emails you know it's just straight yeah. from the horse's mouth and um you know, I've kind of gone back and forth with Elon as well. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, they've positioned him to almost be a right wing idol, you know, yep. and almost yep. kind of taking that place as Trump. And, you know, I just made a meme, actually, it's going to go out in the next few days here, which I think is probably one of my better ones in the past few months. But it's basically like four reasons to be skeptical of Elon Musk. And mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important that we are skeptical and we're looking at yep. all these things. But at the same time, Joe, like he's done a great service to the you know first amendment to freedom of speech and to just understanding the way that these big tech platforms operate by introducing these twitter files and giving them uh to let's also remember to some of these more independent journalists yeah uh, and i know he he started them off with matt taibbi and uh you know he obviously worked for rolling stone at one point he has his own stub sub stack now but i i would say that he's somebody that's on our side you know he's an ally yeah. of ours in fact, he did an article on me and the Free Thought Project in 2018. I was actually in Rolling Stone magazine, if you can believe that. I'm like, goofy mug here. It was actually <laughs> in print in the magazine. Beauty. Uh, so, yeah, crazy. So I hope you have that on your wall. I don't have my wall. I have it right down here. I even have a backup copy just in case, but Got it's it. not going anywhere anytime soon. It was <laughs> a, a highlight for sure. And uh, yeah. I still very much appreciate that he, he took the time to cover the story and give us some exposure. In fact, he was the only person to do that out of all mm -hmm. the mainstream coverage, even though Facebook and Twitter took us down on the same day, which should be a freaking huge red flag. But even he called me a conspiracy theorist, fringe, a fringe conspiracy theorist. So, you know, I guess for Rolling Stone, he kind of had to, you know, throw that in there just to appease the, the lefties over there. But, um, yeah, I, I had to reach out to Matt Taibbi because it felt like a great opportunity for, to hear not only uh you know his take on things which he did a great job breaking down the first original twitter files but 
hopefully, possibly getting him on our podcast, much like Elon, you know, instead of giving the, the information to some corporate journalists, like he passed it down to independent mm-hmm. journalists, like, hey, man, like keep that train going, Matt, like help us out, give us some exposure, like come do your first interview with us. Unfortunately, he didn't ever book the interview, but he basically said, like, if I come across any information that proves that these people were, you know, in fact, involved with taking you down, I will reach out to you. Yeah, I will get that information to you. So that was that was certainly, uh, you know, a a positive. But um, yeah, you know, there's been so much information that's come out over. I think we're on like the 13th different Twitter file now. Yeah. And somewhere uh, around there. Somewhere around there. I, I honestly haven't kept up with all of it. And I know I mentioned to you, I was going to really try to dig in. and I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, but I did notice that just recently, uh, in fact, I think it was like yesterday or today, uh, the, the 13th batch came out. And uh, it, it turns out that a uh, ex-FDA, uh, current Pfizer exec was also manipulating behind the scenes, Scott Gottlieb. He was also manipulating mm-hmm. behind the scenes uh, some of the, the Twitter users' information. And um, we also know that Jen Pazaki, while she was uh, the White House spokesperson, also admitted that they're moderating the COVID policies yeah. for Facebook and stuff. So we know this is happening, but this particular incident that happened with Scott Gottlieb was actually focused on uh, the journalist Alex Berenson, mm-hmm. Berenson, I think I'm saying that right, who is like a, a New York Times science editor at one point, doesn't write for them anymore. He kind of took off on his own and did more of the independent thing and kind of blew up during the COVID years just because yeah. he was highly critical of it. But it turned out that uh, this Gottlieb character was actually instrumental in trying to take him down as well. And so... Um, I'm not sure if you follow that case at all, Joe, yeah. but uh, he w- sued Twitter for a breach of contract, basically saying that Twitter had never given him any formal warnings before they took down his account. And so um, the motion, he won the motion to to, to, to miss, dismiss, basically Twitter wanted to dismiss the case. He won it. And so uh, Twitter kind of realized that they were in hot water, like there wasn't going to look good for them. So they ended up paying him out a settlement and reinstating his account. So yeah. the fact that this has kind of come full circle and now that we know for sure that there was a government yeah. employee, uh, a Pfizer exec, I guess, ex, ex-government employee, Pfizer exec, who was kind of behind the scenes and manipulating these things, which is even kind of a more of a red flag if you think about it, because he's not even associated to the government anymore. He's just a Pfizer exec. Yet which he's is the same thing. Moderating. <laughs> yeah, it is. Technicalities, I guess. The revolving but, door, right? Sure, I mean, it's sure. Happens over and over again. So to me, that that's absolutely insane. And it's just wow, like, so some of this stuff that has kind of surfaced, it, it really is kind of filling in the blanks and connecting the dots of the information that we all suspected, but now we actually yeah. have evidence and proof for. Yeah, and, and in a world where, you know, evidence and proof is is part of the ways in which in our material world that we, we continue to, um, you know, make sense of things together, like that's how we get the ball rolling by by connecting to each other in some way through, proof right so there's there's a value to that in in bringing more people into the conversation more people into the fold um so i you know i, I again I, I similar to you i I'm, I'm skeptical of of elon in a number of ways and i don't believe that um you know just because we're amped up about the possibility of revealing the truth about big tech and censorship that it means you know you're about to go get Neuralink installed in your brain sure. like there's a difference yeah. there right yeah, yeah and um and i i think i i think that <laughs> You know, there's there's almost uh, I think 2023 personally, my personal feelings that we're going to see more and more of the destruction of the mainstream narrative around how, oh, no, it's always just missing. We're always right about misinformation and the fact checkers are always right. And big tech is always right about it. I think we're going to see just how nefarious the government has been yep. in in taking out dissenting voices and this idea of, you know, domestic propaganda coming right from the government themselves. Like, you know, it's always this idea to, you know, sort of pure blooded, uh, whether they're proud to be Canadian, proud to be American, proud to be whatever, uh, part of England, whatever it is. There's always this idea that there are, that their, their own countries are not creating propaganda. Right. right. And I think sure. what we're seeing is just how incorrect that is. And we're getting the evidence for it. And, um, I think evidence speaks and the more people that I, I, I think see, what's really going on, the more, uh, you, know, you know, I think they're going to kind of wake up to, to our other things. Cause it, it, this leads back to one other thing. I'd just be curious to get some of your thoughts on 
which is that so much of what these prominent scientists and doctors and journalists now, so much of what they're talking about in the last two years, we've been talking about for 15 years. And there's people before us that we're talking about, you know, 20 years before that. But, but now these people are, are in the fold and they're, they're, you know, Matt Taibbi might've called you a conspiracy theorist in 2018. Would he yep. still in 2023? Yeah. Doubtful. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting, right? Because I, I what I've found fascinating is there's a whole new group of people that are, are more attracted to these um, academic voices, let's say, sure. that are talking about the same things we've all been talking about for, yeah. for years. Yeah, yeah. And in some way, from just a collective perspective, it's, 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 it's increased the, you know, the amount of people and let's say the quality of conversation that's happening sure. about these very things, you know, and, and there's a plus there, um, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. There is. And that's ultimately what we want. Right. And that's why we're in this business. That's why we do what we do, because we're trying to wake people up. We're trying to collectively evolve. Eh, eh, eh. Eh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I agree with you. And that's ultimately a good thing. I don't want to downplay that at all, but it does make our positions, people who have been in this world for a long time, Hard. that much more challenging. Before we cap off here, what's the, what's the, what's, what's the silver lining? What do we What's the positives? Is there science. anything that yeah, you see there? Is, man. I think I touched on it for a second, but I mean, I don't think we would have seen the same response to COVID if yeah. we hadn't been, if people like us hadn't been doing this type of work. And I, I know, you know, I, I haven't mentioned this yet in the conversation, but I also run a police accountability organization called Police the Police. And I would say largely like we've done more good and we've created more change by sharing these viral videos than incremental legislation reform has ever done, you know? So mm -hmm. the silver lining is that this is still, even with the thumbs still coming down, you know, the th the throttles of press, uh, all these things, all these elements that are up against us, we're still making headway. And the internet is still a very formidable, very powerful tool to share this information, to wake people up. And we're winning the war just by putting out memes. And that I think that's the silver lining is that no matter how hard they try, even with their trillion dollar machines, you know, every, all their propaganda, all this Twitter files behind the scene manipulation, we're still winning the information war. And we will continue to win as long as we have the internet and it's up and we can still peer to peer communicate with each other. So I think we're having an influence. I think we're starting to create this larger conversation as we both mentioned at least a couple of times during this conversation of information and topics that didn't exist 20 years ago. And we're slowly but surely pushing out the mainstream and the corporate press. And of course, we help expedite that during our years when we were really thriving. And in fact, I would go as far to say that we were basically starting to inch them out. And that's why mm -hmm. they panicked, hit the brakes and the whole fake news narrative started to roll out. The whole Russia yep. collusion narrative started to roll out. So I think they knew in 2016, 2017, that they were starting to get their ass kicked by just a couple people on the internet who were dedicated and, and principled and, and trying to share information and were clever about doing it and how they rolled out that information with the memes, with the videos. And so I think that's the silver lining is that I don't ultimately think they're gonna win. I don't think there's anything they could do to stop us. And no matter what happens, even if they do take down the next parlor, well, guess what? We're gonna have a new server that comes up that's uh, you know, that's peer to peer or people who are uh, anarchists who are creating it and hosting it or whatever. So there's going to always be some type of uh, cause and, and effect and some type of response to the, the pendulum of tyranny that's continuing to swing towards uh, censorship. That's it. That's all. And I think there is somewhat of a critical mass that has been reached to some extent. And I think it'll continue through 2023 that there's just too many people that are now seeing the degree to which the censorship is occurring, the, 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 the silliness of it, the, how much it's actually incorrect and wrong. And there's too many powerful people with, with that. I'm, that are not necessarily nefarious, um, that now get it and that, that want to want to see it stopped. And I, and I don't know that it's going to be easy to continue to pull this off, uh, in the future. And, uh, and that I think is, is promising as well. But, uh, yeah, yeah I mean, brother. that's it. That's all I, you know, this was a good convo. I'm sure it was somewhat cathartic as well, you know, Absolutely, to, man. 
Yeah. In <laughs> fact, I'm I'm on a Facebook ban right now, man. So this yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> they hit yeah. me with a three day. It turned into a four day, and that's over. And now I still can't post. So I mean, oh, it's always geez. something with these people. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're still at it you know, hopefully you can, you continue at it or, you know, Hey, I mean, I've, I've asked this to myself too. If there comes a point where, Hey, I just, I get inspired to do something else. I'll go do that. You know, I'm, sure. I'm not attached, but it's the type of thing where I've, I've sat, I've, I've wholeheartedly said to myself, you know what, like, what if I just walked away? Like, what would I do? And I've, and I've sat with it for weeks at a time. And I'm like, I don't know, this is kind of, this always lands back at what I want to keep doing, even okay. if it's tough and challenging. So um, it is what it is, but, uh, you know, thank Great, you brother. for doing what you're doing and, uh, you know, sticking to it and that's it. That's, that's what we, that's what we got to do. Absolutely. My friend, I agree a hundred percent. And, uh, I don't think I could do anything else with myself, even though I wanted to, I mean, I, I will, and I have to make money, but I'll still be doing yeah. this, you know? It's yeah. In my blood, so. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just the last note, not to, we're, it's not like we're martyrs. It's more like it's just an inspiration, a passion, you know, at least that's how I feel. Sure. And remember what Bruce Lee said, you know, you're never defeated until you admit, admit defeat. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to ever admit defeat. I'm going to keep working and they're not going to stop me. I'm going to keep talking and I'll keep putting it out and as many different platforms as possible. So they'll never be able to, to shut me up. I guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming on, sharing your thoughts. Absolutely. Brother. Thanks for having me on, man. That was great.